Hey, this is Mike Freilink. I'm the pastor at The Gathering, and I'd like to welcome you today as you listen to this week's message. I pray it encourages you, challenges you, and draws you closer to God and His purposes for your life. Well, what an exciting day. What an exciting day is we get to celebrate the fact that Jesus changes lives and changes them a lot. So we celebrate with four of our family who are going through the waters of baptism. That he, Jesus, makes all things new. All things new. Four lives that have walked different paths to get to this point today, but have all arrived at the same destination. One destination because of the one, Jesus. Four lives that have been changed, all because they encountered, all because they accepted and invited Jesus in. And that offer of new life is to us all, but only to those who accept that invitation, who accept that offer, will receive. It was Jesus who said, as recorded in the book of Revelations, who said, behold, I stand at the door and, and knock. Revelations 3, chapter 20 says, here I am. There's an exclamation point there as Jesus announces his presence on the doorstep of people's lives. Here I am. If anyone, it's all inclusive, hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. What an incredible invitation that God extends to us all. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Because none of us here deserve what Jesus did for us on the cross. None of us. You may think that you deserve it slightly more than the person next to you, and you would be wrong. King David said this, that all have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. None of us deserve what Jesus offers here. This room today is full of people who should not be here. Except for Jesus. Except for Jesus. We don't deserve to be here. We don't deserve to get in on what God has done for us except for Jesus. I know you might be looking at me today and think, geez, Mike is good. And this may blow your mind that I wasn't always this good. I know it's hard, it's hard to fathom. I struggle with that realization at times. But I, exactly like you, should not be here. And I don't know everybody's story here today. I don't know what kind or what levels of dysfunction were or were in your life. But I know one thing, that we were all rudderless hopeless, lost, all doing our very best to hold it together. And some of us doing a better job of that than others. But truth be told, before Jesus, none of us were doing great. I want to let you in on a little secret. I'm not sure if you should be concerned, but those who ministered to you last week before Jesus... Wow. Steph shared communion last week. Steph and Jonah before Jesus, a mess. Messed up. They're still a little bit messed up, but uh, they're doing a lot better. And it gets worse than Justin shared the word. I mean, Justin and Barb before Jesus, messed up. Yep, still, and he he admitted it before I got in there. Still a little bit messed up. Not you, Barb, just Justin. But uh, messed up. Lives in wreck and ruin. Trail of destruction behind. But Jesus, but Jesus, he, he makes, he makes all things. He makes all things new. He gives us beauty for ashes. 
At the cross, the cross of Christ is a place of exchange where we get to give our, our worst and receive his best. Even our best is, is, is said to be as filthy rags. Even our best efforts are putrid and worthless and nothing in his sight. But yet he takes, willingly takes our worst and we get his best. He makes all things new. He took me, a broken, weak, insecure, self-hating, drunken, promiscuous drug addict, and he makes all things new. It's what he does. And not because I was good, because I was anything but good, but because he was, and he still is, and he always will be good. He alone is good. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone, I just love that again, it's, the invitation is wide open. It's all inclusive. Nobody's excluded. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All of this from God, not some of this from God and some from you. You've nothing to contribute to this. All of this from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them thank you Jesus and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation we therefore us now are Christ's ambassadors as though God, through us, were making an appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Because God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. All this from God through Jesus. We have been made right, made new, reconciled to God. Jesus didn't come just to tweak and adjust our lives a bit. He came to take the old and give us the new. He came to take the damaged and give us the functional. He came to take the flesh and give us the spirit. He's not looking to fix your life. He's looking to exchange your brokenness with his life himself. He came to exchange, to put off the old, to receive the new. To become a new creation. Born again. For those of us that have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are born again. This is not a title just reserved for Pentecostal believers. We are born again believers. For those of us that have received him, we are born again. Born not of flesh, but of his spirit. There's a man named Nicodemus who, like many of us here in this room, recognized that there was something incredibly profound of the man Jesus Christ and had a, an amazing encounter with him. John chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Verily, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, Verily I tell you that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases and you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who was born of the Spirit. Jesus didn't come to make our old life better. He came to give us new life. 
And I feel here to just take a moment to stop. I think for those of us that have been on a journey with Jesus for so many years, we can fall into the trap of trying to fix things, to fix brokenness in our lives. And we can even ask Jesus to come and help us fix them. And I feel that it's more than a play on words today because Jesus doesn't want to come and fix our brokenness. He wants to take our brokenness and replace it with wholeness. It's always about a divine exchange. He's not looking to put a band-aid on so that sore heel. No, he's wanting to cut that out and replace it with something new. And no matter how long we've been on the journey with Jesus for, he's not looking to fix you. He's looking to take that which is old and broken and flawed and replace it with his life. Amen. Born again life. He's making all things new. He is a God who redeems and he is a God who restores. He's a God who comes into those places and spaces in our lives where there is no life. Where there is no hope, where everything looks dead and and buried and gone, finished over. And he restores it back. He brings it back to life. And we see this, this message of God's restoration heralded through the prophet Joel. Looking at chapter 2, starting at verse 23. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you autumn rains Because we are good, because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the locusts have eaten. Those things that have been consumed, gone, finished, dead, buried, over. God says, I will repay you for the years that the locusts have eaten. The great locusts, the young locusts, the other locusts. There's lots of locusts. There's a lot of consuming going on. But how indicative, how representative is that of our lives at times where we go, it wasn't just a small thing. It wasn't just for a little while. It was for a long while, God, and it's gone and it's buried and it's dead and it's over. And we can look at those things and those situations and circumstances in our lives and say, God, can you move? God says, I will, I will repay. I will repay. My great army that I sent among you, you will have plenty to eat until you are full. And you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. He's doing it for you. You don't need to do it for yourself. Just surrender. He is looking to do it for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. It's in the original text that God says, not I will repay, but that I will sure lamb. Sure lamb is a Hebrew word, which means restore or to restore. God is going to take those beat down, damaged, worn, misused, abused, mistreated things in our lives and perform an incredible restoration. Listen to this. Restoration is the action of returning something to a former owner, to a former place, or to a former condition. How good is that? In Jesus, he returns us to our former owner, right standing with God, to our former position in his presence, and to our original condition, free before him. I don't know what's been done, said in your past, but Jesus is the master restorer and he makes all things new. And not just back there one day, for those of us that have been Christians for a long time, not just back there at that point of decision. He didn't just make things new, he's, he's still making things new. And in this room, we all look good today. We all smell good, at least from here. We're all singing good. We're all smiling, shaking hands, we're being nice. But there's brokenness in this room. There's dysfunction in this room. There's, there's loss of hope at times and confusion and chaos. 
And there, there, there in those places, in those places, God's wanting to make all things new. Brokenness that we've carried, luggage that we've carried for some time. God's wanting to make all things new. You might often hear of or might know of or are one of those people that like restoring things, like restoring houses or cars or toys or furniture. You might be that person or you might know of others or like restoring those kinds of things. You're always looking or at or taking on another restoration project. But we, friends, we are Jesus' restoration project. We're all a restoration in, pro, in, in process, in progress. You know, we should all wear signs. <laughs> restoration in progress. God's working on me. Now, this is not an excuse to, to do things that we know and to live ways that we shouldn't, but, but God's at work here. I know you've been damaged. Some things are a bit banged up. Maybe it's because of you. Maybe it's because of others. Maybe it's just life. And you may think it's too late. It's over. The years have consumed it. It's done. It's dusted. But, but, but it's not. Because he makes all things new. He restores and he redeems. It's a young girl, young girl Ruth, who, who finds herself in a foreign land in dire situations and circumstances. She, uh, she, she, she's at the bottom. She's just going through picking up scraps so she can eat. She has no ability in and of herself to turn her situation around when a man named Boaz, her redeemer, steps in and makes a way where there was no way. Yeah, things were bad and they were getting worse. That, that, that's us. We are Ruth. We are the Ruth. We, we're the ones that have no ability to turn the situation and circumstance around in our own strength and our own ability. And Boaz, he is, he is Jesus to us. But Jesus made a way where there was no way. He is our redeemer. And he doesn't rescue us because we're good, because we are not. He rescues us because he is good and he is faithful. While we were at our worst, he came to give us his best. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom now we have gained access by faith into grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in sufferings. What? Because we know that sufferings produce perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You see that just at the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. This room is full of people who don't deserve and can never earn what Jesus has done for us. Full of those who are powerless and still are powerless apart from him to get ourselves out of our own mess and be right before God. This room is full of people who don't deserve to be here, except Jesus. All because of Jesus and all because of his great love for us. If I could have keys up, that'd be great. We see all throughout the Bible. I mean, every, every story is, is pointing to, to our brokenness. And to the hope that's found alone in Jesus Christ and how he's wanting to restore us and redeem us. I mean, in that, in that, that, that picture uh, of, of Ruth, we are Ruth. Jesus is Boaz. We are the lost ones. In, in, when, when it comes to uh, King David and the nation of Israel, we're, we're, not, we're not King David out there fighting the giants. No, we're the scared Israelites. 
And King David is a picture of Jesus. All throughout Scripture, we see these amazing pictures and illustrations of, of, the, of the demonstration and the length that God goes to to redeem us and to restore us back to Him, to win us back, to show us that His love is great for us. And we see this unfathomable and unconditional love of God displayed so powerfully in the life of a guy named Hosea. Can you imagine being Hosea for those of us that know the story? A devoted follower of God and you're like, God, what's your plan for my life? What's my calling? What's my mission in life? God, I want to serve you. I want to give you my everything and live for you. And God's like, okay, Hosea, I want to use you. I want to use you mightily to show the nation of Israel, my people, that no matter what they've done, I love them. That no matter what they've done, I I forgive them. And even though they've rejected me, I've not rejected them. Wow, what an incredible message, God. You want you want to use me to share that powerful message with your people. Wow, God, how are you going to do that? Well, Hosea chapter 1, verse 2. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him. Go and marry a prostitute. If you're Hosea, I mean, I'm sure you're you're at least swallowing hard. You're like, hey, what? Go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. Because this, this will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshipping other gods. Wow. And as predicted, Hosea's beautiful bride, Gomer, was unfaithful. Hosea chapter 3, verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, go and love your wife again. Even though she commits adultery with another lover, this will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel. Even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. What incredible lengths. What incredible lengths God has and still continues to go to, to show us of his great love for us. We don't get this because we deserve it. Because we are good. No, because we are not. We are Goma. We are the unfaithful wife in this story. We get life himself because he is good. We are the object of his affection and his love. And he makes all things new. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that who shall ever believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We are in a room of people who should not be here. But Jesus, he makes all things new. Not just at the point of decision to follow him. We are his restoration projects. And I just know as I was praying again this morning for you and and over this word and just allowing God time to speak to me afresh and anew. I just know there's things that have been carried into this room today. And, and, and the longer we walk with Jesus, I think the easier it is to disassociate from our brokenness. Because in a sense, we look back and go, he made all things new. And we therefore sometimes look at our problems like I shared earlier, like we've just got to fix them. Because he's made it all, all new. And, and, and we've got to get to it. And, and, and we've got to get involved. And, and we do need to get involved to a level, obviously. But we've got to work it out. And, 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 and it's not how Jesus works. And there's people in this room like myself that have walked with Jesus for a long time and, 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 and you're a restoration project and, and there's, some, there's some hurt or brokenness or fear or insecurity, something that God has begun to put his finger on your life. And this morning, he's wanting to make all things new. This isn't a salvation message. This is the message. We don't graduate the gospel as Christians. He's still doing a work. We are restoration in progress. 
He, Jesus, is working on me. And I just believe this morning that God is speaking to many here in this room today. That He's wanting you to not ask Him to fix it. He's wanting you to hand it over and give it to Him so He can give you life. We're going to celebrate communion. So if you take your communion and let's all do it at once, just rip those things off. Thanks, sweetie. The night before Jesus went to the cross to pay the price that we couldn't pay to bridge the gap we couldn't bridge. To take upon the sins of all mankind for all time, he gathered together with his disciples in an upper room and he gave thanks. Again, to explain to them those things that he was about to do on our behalf. It was to go to the cross, to make a way where there was no way. So that we who were sinful would be seen as sinless. Because if we would receive that which he would do for us, we'd be washed by his blood. Our sin no longer seen. Rather, when God looks at us, he sees Jesus covered, washed in his blood. He took the bread and and he gave thanks and he broke it. He said, "This this is my body given for you, for your sins. I want you to take it and I want you to eat it. And in doing so, remember me. And as we, just before we eat just now and drink, it's really felt that there was four things that Jesus wanted us to remember this morning. Firstly, number one, that that he has made all, all things new. Secondly, that he is still making all things new. Thirdly, we therefore take him to others because he's wanting to make all things new in others. And fourthly, for those here today that have never responded to what Jesus has done, we remember that he wants to make all things new in you. So we thank you, Father God, that you sent your son. We remember as we eat now, the great lengths that you went to, to win us back, to make all things new in us. We give you thanks and praise. Let's eat. Thank you, Jesus. The same way he took the cup, he... He blessed that he said, this is my blood, the blood of an everlasting covenant. I want you to take it and in doing so, remember me. Let's drink this morning. We thank you, Jesus, for the great lengths that you went to, to redeem us, to restore us, to buy us back to win us over. You are redeemer. You are restorer. You are healer. You are our hope. You are life himself. You don't just offer life as a commodity, as a resource. You offer us yourself. You don't ask anything of us except just to receive that for which you've done. So we thank you that you've made all things new. We thank you that you're making all things new. We receive your call to go and tell other people that you're wanting to make all things new and remind those that he is wanting to do that in them today. Just before we move on, if we could just have every head bowed, every eye closed. As most weeks, I don't know everybody in the room. And Jesus extends an invitation to us all this morning. As mentioned early in Revelations 320, Jesus is saying to you today, here I am. Here I am. 
I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Maybe you're here today and you've sensed Jesus knocking before or maybe just it's just this morning, just now, that you feel something is stirring in your spirit. You sense him knocking and you've never responded before to that invitation that he extends to you and today you'd like to do so. You'd like him to come and make all things new and receive that for which he has done for you. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just ask you to raise your hand just so I know who I'm praying with this morning. If that's you, you know, to say, yeah, Jesus, I, I felt you knocking. I just want to respond to that this morning and invite you in. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if there's anybody here today, shoot your hand up. I'll see if you can put it down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we just thank you for the great lengths that you've gone to to redeem us, to make all things new. I pray for every heart in this place this morning that you would continue that restoration process and progress in all of our lives. I pray that right now that you'd call to mind those things, Lord God, in the hearts of your people that have been buried and hidden, that we've tried to fix, or it's just so ugly, it's so painful, that we just try and just push it to the side. But you're you're wanting to go there. You're wanting to make that new. And you're not wanting to fix it. You're not wanting to tweak it. You're wanting to do surgery. You're wanting to cut it out and, and put in something new. So I pray, Heavenly Father, for every heart, that you might come and overwhelm, We're in worship. I just had that word come that God's wanting to overwhelm you. To completely cover you. God, we pray that you might move mightily in people's lives this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said... Amen, amen, amen.